Hello. Bada bing, bada bam. Bada bing, bada bam. Welcome to this week's Bacon a Mystery, Bacon a Murder episode. This episode is like the Halloween special, even though it doesn't really feel Halloweeny out here because what is that? That's a pile of fucking colorful rocks, and here's a skull. So freaking scary. Let me explain. I wanted to do like the whole spider webs, all of that. Um, I don't have space in this apartment, so. <laughs> We're making some Halloween candy cookies. I'm so excited about this. This is gonna be a foolproof, knock on wood, a foolproof Halloween cute little recipe. When you've already gotten your little trick-or-treating done, this is what you're gonna do with your leftover candy. Let's hope it works well. Huh. So with that being said, we're not really doing a psychological thriller today. Even though it is kind of a psychological thriller, it's categorized as a horror movie because Oof. we're all a bunch of Halloween so I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, this one is called Bodega Coffee by Literary. So I've got some Halloween candy. I wanted to get the pumpkin-shaped Reese's peanut butter cups. I wanted to get all of that. Tell me why the Target in New York City has absolutely nothing. There is nothing entertaining. There is no browsing being done. Nothing. So I got some Kit Kats and some chocolate chip cookies. And um, this is like the worst package. <laughs> Roots. Crunch, Butterfinger, and a hundred grand. It's uh -huh. not even, it's not even. Uh, Are they good? No, they're not good, but we're gonna do it. So, have you guys seen the movie? The Black Phone. It was unexpectedly good. I wanted to do a horror movie for Halloween, but most of these horror movies really rely on visuals and jump scares. I mean, a lot of these, okay, to be fair, a lot of these horror movies these days, they're good right but there there's so many of them that most of them remind me of corn videos like nobody watches for the plot what? everybody's in it for the vibe everybody's in it for the visuals you know like the plot is not the strongest thing in the world how many more haunted houses how many more i didn't know i had a great grandfather that was rich and he left me an inheritance in this house and now i gotta go to the house but like who are all these weird creepy uncles i've never met before someone was murdered <laughs> so it's a lot of visuals, but this one was both. There was a lot of plot. It's actually done by Blumhouse Productions. They do a ton of like the really good horror movies. I think they did Hereditary, uh, Paranormal Activities, all of those. Which I know Paranormal Activity. If you have, if you weren't there when it first came out, it was like a it was like a showstopper in the industry. Now, now if it came out, it'd be like another scary movie. But it was pretty innovative at the time. Okay, so you're gonna need two different types of cookie doughs. You're going to need a chocolate chip cookie dough mix. You can obviously make your own cookie dough, but after Halloween, really, that's what you're doing? Now, the story was inspired by, you know, Stephen King? Yes. Horror movie king, horror movie legend. Well, his son is also a horror movie king, wrote a short story, and this is based off of that short story. Oh, so it's in the family. Yeah, it's in the family, like Game of Thrones and House of Dragons. It's really good. With that being said, let me start creeping you out. Okay, so I'm gonna grab two of the chocolate chip cookie bites. Then we're gonna put one of the short sugar cookies on top. Anyway, the movie opens up with a baseball game and it's very much giving small town vibes. And you guys know how I feel about small town vibes. I'm over it, okay? It's like this whole idea of like, nobody locked their doors. I'm done with that line, okay? But I do love baseball, so uh, go balls. It's a bunch of young kids. They look like maybe they're in high school, but freshmen, you know, sophomores, not the seniors, that's for sure. It's a bunch of young kids playing baseball. And I would say that maybe they're 16, some are younger, some are older, and it's all the girls in the bleachers, and they're rooting for a boy named Finney, and he's killing it. The pressure, the pressure is intense, and all the while, he's been doing really well. That is, until the girl that he has a crush on is spotted in the bleachers. Shouldn't he do better? No, because the pressure was too much. The pressure to perform got too high, and he fumbled the ball. He's the... I don't know what this is in baseball, and you guys are going to kill me for it, but the one that throws the ball? The pitcher? Yeah, like a thrower. Yeah. <laughs> so he throws the ball, right? Yeah. And he spots that girl. So this next time that he's throwing the ball, the other team get a home run, and they win the game. But all the kids seem to have really good sportsmanship. They're all good about high-fiving each other. They're good gaming each other. Even the guy that got a home run, his name is Bruce, and he tells Finney, your arm is mint, dude. Like, you got a really good arm. 
So it's like really cute. Now after the game, you see Bruce riding his bike down the small town residential streets where he's just living the life. There's music playing in the background. It's giving small town high schooler living the dream. There's girls that are hanging out in their yard that are like, hi Bruce, cause he just won the game. And he's Asian, so woo, representation. But he dies, so. <laughs> They're like, representation, but don't get too excited. We gotta kill him off right now. Are you making a snowman? It's like a nipple. <laughs> anyway, he feels like life is unstoppable. Life is good. They're playing that happy music, and it all comes to a screeching halt when he sees a big black van stop in front of him while he's riding his bike. Now back to Finney, because that's our main character. He's not living his best life like Bruce seemed to be. First of all, he lost the game, and sure, everybody has good sportsmanship, but you gotta be a little bit disappointed in yourself, right? But we also see that he lives in this broken down home where there's stains all over the kitchen walls, it feels like his mom doesn't live there, which sounds sexist to say, but that's the vibe that they were giving, you know? It doesn't feel like a home. It feels very sterile, but not clean just not cozy, and his dad barely talks to him. Even during breakfast, he puts up this giant newspaper in front of him, blocking his view of his own children so he doesn't have to watch them eat, and Finney's just sitting there, zoning out, slurping on his cereal, and the newspaper slowly comes down, revealing his father's very scary-looking face, and he says, you think you can slurp that a little louder? Then, once you have your cookies, you're going to want to get your Halloween candies. So this one is one of my favorites. It's the Tiny Tony's Chocolamonies. Chocolonies. I'm going to put this one on the center and just kind of push it down. So it looks like this. Now, obviously, if you had a pumpkin or something, it'd be so cute. Yeah. Okay, so you need to bake it for 13 to 17 minutes at 350. You think you can slurp a little bit louder? It sounded very much like a threat. So anyway, his little sister comes downstairs to get her breakfast from the kitchen, and she opens the bread box, making a sound on the countertop, and she freezes. Finny visibly cringes, and she starts profusely apologizing. I mean, it's clear that their father is probably very abusive, very scary, a threatening man. But they manage to walk to school without any scratches, at least that we know of. And on the walk, Gwen, the sister, starts talking about her plans for life. She has it all planned down, even to the kid that she's going to marry. And Finney is listening intently until he stops at this fenced yard and he sees a flyer that's hung up. Look, it's new. Mrs. Yamadaya must have been putting them up again. And both their eyes fall on the missing poster flyer for Bruce. Remember the black van? Yeah. The Asian kid is missing? I told you. He got two seconds of fame. Oh my god. <laughs> Finney looks almost relieved that someone's still looking for Bruce, but Gwen looks nervous and sad. And so he notices this, and he looks at his sister and says, you don't think they're going to find him, do you? Just not how they want to. Come on, let's go. We're going to be late. So when they get to school, or maybe like a block away from school, there's a huge commotion, a big circle of kids screaming, fighting, and they're like, fight, fight, fight. And would you look at that? The school bully, they call him Moose, was trying to bully this younger kid, but little did he know that this younger kid was an MMA fighter in training. He beat the shit out of Bruce. Probably one of the most coordinated high schoolers I have ever seen on the screen. Straight up CIA assassin style beating that this guy dished out. And in the end, he climbs on top of Moose and starts beating his face to a bloody pulp. Now, this is where we see an interesting dynamic between Gwen and her brother, Finney. Gwen wants to stay and watch, and she's into it. She's not scared of blood or gore. She's like, yeah, f fight. Meanwhile, Finney is dragging her away, and she's getting upset. Why not? Moose had it coming. Remember last year when he beat you up? Yeah, Gwen, I remember. I was there. <laughs> so then you know he had it coming. No, no one has that type of beating coming. Well, it was stupid of him to pick a fight with Robin Ariano. He's one of the toughest kids in the school. Since the grabber took the toughest kid, Vance. Since the what? The grabber took the toughest kid, Vance. So Vance is a kid's name, and he was the toughest kid in school. But the grabber took him? So Who's the grabber? Finney says, I wish you wouldn't call him that. What, the grabber? That's what the papers are calling him. So it seems like Bruce is not the only victim to this kidnapping. Oh, there is it. someone out there kidnapping boys in this neighborhood, mm. and they call him the grabber, because he grabs the boys. 
And Gwen's like, what? You don't want me to say his name? You don't actually believe that stupid story, do you? No. Because he can't hear you. He doesn't actually kidnap kids that say his name. No, I know, Gwen. I know that. Finny, then just say it. Just say the grabber. No, I'm not gonna... There's no point in me saying... Finny, are you chicken? And it's silent while they walk the rest of the way to school, and I guess they were a block away when the fight broke out, and Gwen apologizes for pushing her brother, and she didn't mean it. Honestly, they have such a good sibling relationship because my sister and I, we would have went to school mad. Okay, we would have went to school mad. But she apologizes, and off in the reconciliation they walk, and we see a black van drive past them. In school, we see that Finn has two main concerns. One, remember the girl that distracted him at the baseball game and resulted in him losing the whole game? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, he's al she's also distracting him in class too. And she even notices him staring at her. So that's awkward. And uh, second, one of his more pressing concerns is that there are three mini bullies. So these bullies are nowhere near as big as moose, but they're like wannabe mooses. They're they're deer. <laughs> they're goose. <laughs> they're gooses, okay? <laughs> and they think that they're tough and bad and they want to beat up Finny because they think Finny is gay. These boys are toxic masculinity and training. So they like to chase Finn all the way to the bathroom after class when the bell rings and he's hiding in one of the stalls and they're calling him the F slur and telling him that he can't use the bathroom because it's for boys and not for, you know, the F slur. And while the three of them are getting ready to jump him in the bathroom, the door opens and in walks Robin Ariano. Remember? Karate kid. Yeah, karate kid. The tough kid. He ignores the three mini bullies and starts talking to Finn. Now it's clear to the boys and to the viewers that he's friendly with Finn. So it's like he's Finn's friend. And he's washing blood from his knuckles in the sink. <laughs> okay. Turn out they're just ketchup. <laughs> And he's like, man, that moose kid got some sharp teeth. My knuckles have been bleeding all first period. The mini bullies look a little scared and awkward, and they're just waiting for him to leave so they can beat up Finn, right? And uh, he says, wait. And he looks at the three bullies, and he says, you guys ever fuck with Finn ever again, and you fuck with me. And the mini bullies look terrified and they scoot out of the bathroom. Meanwhile, Finn starts thanking Robin. And honestly, I'm interested to see what their relationship is like, you know? Why, do they, why are they friendly? And uh, Robin just says, you know, one of these days, you got to start standing up for yourself sooner or later. I know. I know. Hey, why did you uh, beat up Moose? He was just shit talking. I was pretty sure that he was going to back down, but nope. I was surprised when he took the first swing, to be honest. I mean, did you have to, though? It looked like you hurt him pretty bad. I mean, I was just going to knock his ass down, wail on him a little bit, but... That wouldn't draw blood. In a situation like this, the more blood the better. For the crowd, you know? It makes a stronger point. Like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. You seen that movie? Oh, Texas Chainsaw, no, it's rated R. My dad would never take me to see a movie like that. Oh, well my uncle takes me to the drive-in movies. We watch everything, but man, that movie is the best movie ever. And they talk about a couple other movies. And then uh, Robin asks to see if Finn will stop by his house after school. Is it math again? Yeah, Finn. Well, Mrs. Johnson just talks too fast. He doesn't even explain it right. Not like you. Can you walk me through it? If I get another F, I'm suspended. Yeah, sure. And so meanwhile, on the other side of school, Gwen is being called out of her math class by the principal, and everyone in the class is looking at each other like, ooh, she's in trouble. And you're like, wow, these kids are freaking dramatic. I'm sure she's not in trouble. But when she gets to the principal's office, there are two detectives waiting for her. You wanted to see me? Please have a seat. I'm Detective Right, and this is Detective Left. <laughs> I forget his name. Okay. Is it true that you're friends with Amy Yama y Yamada, Bruce's little sister? Oh. Uh, we have homeroom together. Is she okay? She's fine. Um, you know what this is about. What did you say to Amy about her brother Bruce? Just that I had a dream about him. What kind of dream? Just a weird one. What happened in the dream? He was taken, that's all by a man with black balloons in a van. Yeah. What else can you tell us about this dream? Why? It's just a dream. Who else knows about the dream? Nobody. It's just a dream. Well, we found two black balloons at the scene, Gwen. We also found one black balloon at the scene of Griffin Stagg's abduction, and we never released those details. So the question is, where did you hear about these balloons? I didn't. It was in my dream. 
I'm gonna ask you again, Gwen. How did you know about the balloons? We need you to tell us. Either there is a leak in our department or, or what? I'm the grabber? You think I kidnapped Vance Hopper last spring? Is that it? Vance got held back twice. I've seen that guy fight. And trust me, he could kick both of your asses blindfolded. Okay. Now the principal gets involved because she's a little embarrassed. Gwen, watch your language. Oh yeah, I took down Vance because obviously I'm the grabber, you f***ing dumb fart knockers. <laughs> Gwendolyn Blake, I said watch your language. And the detective smirks and says, Gwen, what are you not telling us? And she looks pensive and she says, sometimes my dreams are right. And now it's getting real interesting. The two Blake siblings walk home past the three mini bullies that look sour in the face because they can't bully Finn anymore because of Robin. And uh, Gwen says, hey Finn, I am staying at Susie's tonight, like every Friday. You know what that means, right? <laughs> yeah, I got it. I'm gonna look after dad. And you better not eat all the ice cream. And with that, Gwen makes a left and he starts heading straight home. And that night, in the most depressing manner, their dad is passed out in the dirty living room with a bunch of empty beer bottles next to him and another one in his hand. He's fallen asleep with it in his hand, the beer bottle. Finn takes it, turns on the TV, and starts eating a bowl of ice cream. And he tries to watch some horror movies. But it's clear that this kid is not the type of kid that loves it. He's clenching his favorite rocket pen. So it's a pen that is shaped like a rocket. And on one side is a pen, and on the other side is a flashlight you can turn on. So when you turn on the flashlight, it looks like the rocket's fire, you know? Mm. He's clenching his pen. He is covering his mouth so he doesn't scream. He even stops eating his ice cream because he's terrified of what he's seeing. It's not even that scary of a movie. He's a little weedy baby, if I'm being honest. So he wakes up on the living room floor the next morning with his little rocket pen clutched in his hand and Gwen is screaming bloody murder from the kitchen. Her dad has her bent over and he's belting her, like literally belting her. Gwenny, they came to my work. And he's smacking her and Finn tries to yell at him to stop, but he won't, he just keeps going. You need to tell me what you know about this investigation, Gwen. I don't know. I'm sorry. Please tell me what you know. And every time she says nothing, he's belting her and he just keeps on hitting her till she can't take it anymore. And she grabs his tequila bottle and threatens him. Hit me again and I'm dropping it. <laughs> you drop that and I'm beating your ass twice as hard. He looks super pissed now that his alcohol is being threatened and she drops it and he throws her to the ground and starts whipping at her and now she is full on sobbing and her dad starts screaming at her and he says, you fucking listen to me, okay? You are not your mother. You hear me? I know. That means you do not hear things that are not there. You do not see things that are not there, okay? They're not there, Gwenny. And she's like sobbing, screaming okay, and her dad keeps going. Your dreams, they're just fucking dreams. Do you understand? Yes, say it. Do you understand? I want to hear you say it. And so she's like, my dreams are just dreams. And she's saying it over and over and over again because he's making her repeat herself. And you can tell even through her sobs that She's kind of like a fighter spirit. Like she's not just giving in, she looks pissed. She looks like she's already plotting her revenge. And when he's done, the dad says, now, good, both of you guys go watch TV. And no ice on that bottom, young lady. I want you to think about what you did. And Finn stays in the kitchen door and is, watches his dad shakily grab a glass of orange juice. Did you know anything about this, Finn? No. Well, same goes for you, got it? Now get out of here. And Finn joins Gwen in front of the TV, where Gwen is shivering on the floor. She rests her head on her older brother for comfort. <gasps> Already? Oh yeah, it's party time. Very, very hot. I'm actually gonna put these on while they're warm because I want them a little melted. Like I want them to kind of sink in, you know? Oh, like when the edges start melting into it and it becomes one. <gasps> I'm so excited excited for these. So we gotta wait for them to cool because I like them, you know. My thing with making cookies on my own is that I eat them way too quickly and I'm just eating pretty much hot cookie dough and it's not even really a cookie at this point. <laughs> 
we have so many birthdays coming up next month and the holidays are literally about to knock on my front door. In November, we have my fiance, me, Andrew, Patricia, and we have all known each other for so long that it's hard to get each other any gifts, you know? Because everything that we could have gifted each other, we've already done it. I mean, what else could we give each other? I have got the solution for you and I have already bought them the greatest gift of all. I have made them all, ladies and lords. No, straight up. They are landowners now because of yours truly. This is the best gift for yourself and for your loved ones. And if you're thinking a lady, like you go around calling yourself a lady and a lord, no, it's real. I have the receipts. Let me show you. I am Lady Stephanie Sue. Established Titles is a project based in historic Scottish custom. So landowners are referred to as lords and ladies. They let you buy as little as one square feet of dedicated land in Edelston, Scotland, and you get this beautiful official certificate with a crest. You can officially be a lady or a lord. And with every order, they are committed to planting a tree. It is just such a fun, novel way of preserving the picturesque woodlands and biodiversity of Scotland and supporting the global efforts by One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future. Which, side note, did you know you can get the prefix Lord or Lady on your credit card, your plane ticket, you can add it to your Instagram bio, your dating profile, because, I mean, it's true. Do you know how much better the service is when you have lady or lord in your reservations at restaurants or on your plane tickets? I mean, I have heard people say that the return of being upgraded nonstop on their flights and hotels is worth the title. I need to test it out. With all the birthdays and the holiday season coming up, I just freaking love established titles where you can get an icebreaker gift, something so unique that they'll remember forever and it's so wholesome, but also meaningful in the sense that they give back to the environment. So whether it's for your friends or your family or for yourself, you can even get couple packs with adjoining plots of land, which is what we did. And if you want to be next to us, established titles told me that the first 200 people purchasing a title pack using my link will effectively be next to my plot within a few minutes of walking, which means our whole family is going to be there. All our little friends are going to be there. You guys are going to be there. We could build a mango kingdom with our whole family landowners. What are you saying? And Established Titles is actually running a massive sale right now. Plus, if you use the code BAM, you can get an additional 10% off. Go to EstablishedTitles.com slash BAM to get your gifts now and help support the channel. Thank you, Established Titles, for sponsoring today's video. So anyway, Gwen rests her head on her older brother for comfort, and the two of them, they stay like that for a really, really long time. Meanwhile, we see Robin walking in the back of a shopping plaza. And it looks like the back of a store. Like imagine the back of your local Ralph's or Kroger, but it's completely empty. Nothing else is back there except for Robin and a black van. And we see a man getting out of it. Now, fast forward to later that night, the kids are still in front of the TV watching TV when the phone rings and the dad picks it up and his whole tone, his whole demeanor changes. Gone is the angry alcoholic father, but in comes a caring voice. I think that's the problem, okay? It seems like this movie is very deep in the sense that the kids love their father because it seems like there's two sides to him. Uh, on one hand, it seems like he's this broken down man who has nothing to live for, who has no one to help him raise the kids. He's just overwhelmed, stressed. And then on the other hand, you have the alcohol-loving dad that takes his rage out on his kids. So it's not like this full-on hatred that they have for him. Uh, Finny? Yeah, dad? Do you know a kid named Robin R. R. Ariano? Yeah, that's it. He's a friend from school. Why? And Gwen and Finn look at each other, but they know what's going on. All of the neighborhood grabs their flashlights and head out into the like the woods, all the local areas. It seems like there's no good luck. Finn looks depressed in his room when they get back, and there's a knock. Gwen comes in. I'm really sorry, Finny. I know he was your friend. Don't say was. He is my friend. I'm sorry. Gwen, can you do that dream thing? It doesn't work like that. Well, have you tried? Of course I've tried. But please, just try again. And we see Gwen go to her room and open up this big dollhouse. So it opens like this, right? Where you can see both sides and it's the inside of the rooms. And um, it's more like a storage unit. She grabs a cross from inside. And she gets on her knees and says, Jesus, I know you know that I'm going to ask you, but I'm going to ask you anyway, okay? My brother needs his friend, and I know that you can't just let him go because you don't interfere or whatever. I don't know the rules, but if you could just help me have a dream or two, we just need something to help the police or me or anyone to help him. I will follow you forever if you do this. Amen. And she jumps into her bed because she hears her dad coming. It's lights out time. Hey, 
Gwenny. No playing after dark. Go to sleep. Okay. Love you, Gwenny. Love you too, Dad. And the next morning, the detectives show up at the Blake residence. Their dad opens the door and he's like, God damn it, Gwenny, what did you do this time? Oh, sorry, Mr. Blake. Um, I'm Detective Wright, and your daughter hasn't done anything wrong, but we were wondering if we could speak with her. So that's how the two detectives end up in the very cramped living room of the Blake house with Gwenny sitting sandwiched between them and her dad hovering protectively over them. We can't hear what they're saying, it's all muted, but it doesn't seem to be good. It seems like they're probably asking if she had another dream or just making sure that she really doesn't know who the kidnapper is, or maybe she has more information, but she doesn't seem to have anything. Meanwhile, Finney is getting chased by the three mini Billies who throw him down to jump him on the way to school because Robin Ariano is gone. So they want to be macho guys. Now, Gwen comes out of their house calling them cocksuckers and beats one of them with a rock. But another one beats her until she's bleeding and she can only watch as the other two that are uninjured continue beating her brother. So with bruises everywhere, their bodies sore, they um, head to school. And in biology class, Finn has to pick a partner to dissect a frog with. And whoever that partner is, is going to be his partner for the rest of the school year. And the class is scrambling to find their friends and to partner up with people. Meanwhile, Finn really has no friends. All of them have been kidnapped so far. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. So, the girl that he likes, remember her? Yeah. She sits down next to him and says, do you need a partner? Aww. Oh, uh, wait, yeah, I, I don't have one. Yeah, I need a partner. By the way, those guys are assholes. What? Everyone's talking about it. This morning, they, um... Oh, yeah, yeah. Your sister's really cool, though. I wish my brothers would back me up like that. And on the way home from school, Gwen is teasing him the whole way. Mm, will you be my lab partner? Mm. Because he told her, you know? <laughs> and then <laughs> she's about to turn left, and Finney's like, wait, where are you going? It's Friday, remember? I'm staying at Susie's. I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, okay, I guess I'll look after Dad. They're not walking together after all this happened? All right, usually like people will be like, right. you have to walk in groups. Yes, or your parents will come yeah. pick you up or something, right? Nothing, or the school well, will have drop-offs or yeah. something, but nope. And Vinny's like, okay, well, I'll look after Dad. And he keeps walking all the way home, which he seems to live quite far. And while he's walking, a black van blocks him. Okay, so he's on the sidewalk. There's a black van parked next to the sidewalk with its, <laughs> with its trunk facing the sidewalk. So it's almost like rear parked. You get it, right? And then, um, the, yeah, there's a guy that's coming out of the black van and walking on the sidewalk with a bag full of supplies. Now, we can tell that this guy is some sort of clown because... Yeah, I know, kind of stereotypical, but it, it's more like a magician than a clown. So he paints his face like a very light shade of powdery white. He has a magician's hat that's a little bit creepy. He's got very strange features. Um, they look very terrifying. And on the side of his van, it says, Ac it says, Ac it says Abacadabra. I get it. Abacadabra? <laughs> So you can rent this guy, right? Uh, and uh, he's now dropped all of his things on the sidewalk, and it just seems like one of those clumsy clown skits, right? And um, he's just ranting, well, isn't this peachy keen? Do you uh, need some help, sir? Would you just hand me my hat over there? And Finney does, and he hands it to him. Sorry about that. I'm a part-time magician. You want to see a magic trick? Sure, yeah. And he grabs a spray paint bottle of sorts and is about to shake it and he's about to do something when Finn notices that inside, a inside the van, he has something strange. He walks up and asks, Are those black balloons in there? And right when he asks, the clown grabs him, opens the back of the van door and sprays inside his mouth with the can that he's holding, probably to knock him out. Finney manages to grab the grabber's arm and bite it as hard as he can until he draws blood and breaks skin. But in the end, the drugs work and the grabber throws him into the back of the van and in the process, some of the black balloons go loose. We see Finn being carried by the grabber into some sort of bunker and the grabber's pissed. He's saying, my arm. I should snap your neck for what you did to my fucking arm. He gets to a bunker, like a cellar in the basement, and drops him on a mattress. The floor, the walls, you know, the ceiling, they're all concrete. It's a very cold, dark, musty place. The only thing adorning the walls is this old phone, like a landline phone. It looks like it's from 
ages ago. But it's still attached to the wall and it's disconnected. The wires are cut and probably hasn't been used in decades. But anyway, the grabber sits down in front of him with a devil horn mask on. I know you're scared, but I'm not gonna hurt you anymore. What I said about snapping your neck, I was angry, that's all. I mean, you did a number on my arm, <laughs> but I'm not gonna hold it against you. Okay, I guess, you know, we could just say we're even. You don't even have to be scared. And the grabber gets closer and closer and starts petting Finn's hair. At this point, Finn has said nothing, but he's giving the grabber a death glare. He literally has so much emotion in this stare that he does throughout the whole movie. It's really intense. It's not even just a kid being like, I'm mad at you. I don't know who this kid is, but he's such a stellar, spectacular actor. So anyways, he's doing this death glare. Listen, kid, nothing bad is going to happen to you here. I give you my word. All right, Johnny? You like soda? I'll tell you what, I'm gonna go get you a soda, and then... Shh! You hear that? It's the phone. I think that's the phone. Did you hear that? No one heard it, by the way. Like, it's not ringing in the background. I'm gonna go get that, see who it is. Then I'm gonna go get you a soda, and then I'll explain everything. And he starts petting Finn's face, and Finn is staring with eyes with anger and horror. He hasn't said a single thing, but he watches as the grabber leaves, and you can hear that loud lock turn as he locks the heavy metal door behind him. Of course, Finn still goes up to it and tries to open it, but it won't budge. It's locked. It won't budge. It's not going anywhere. Then connected to the room with the mattress is like this very short hallway and a bathroom. It's just another solid concrete room, and there's a dirty toilet in it, no sink, that's it. The walls of the entire bunker are completely rusted. It just looks really bad. Finn tries to work the phone on the wall, but there's no sound. There's no dial tone, nothing. The wire itself is disconnected. So defeated, Finn goes back to the musty mattress on the ground and lays down. It looks like he's accepted his kidnapping. Meanwhile, Gwen is at her friend's when her mom says, Gwen, sweetie, your dad's on the phone. Susie's mom says that. She picks it up, and we don't know what he's saying, presumably that they're looking for Finn, but Gwen hasn't seen him, not since school, and she looks horrified. She runs out of Susie's house in complete darkness, races all the way home, and on the way she sees police officers out everywhere, roaming the streets, looking for him. I mean, she is paralyzed in fear. She's sitting on the ground next to the fence, watching everyone look for him, and she, she doesn't know what to do. So she rushes inside and starts sobbing in front of her altar, praying for a dream, any sort of dream. And then the phone rings in Finn's room. His bedroom or underground bunker? Underground bunker. The broken phone? The disconnected broken phone. Huh. And he looks confused, but he walks over to it, picks it up, and behind him, a voice rings. It doesn't work. Not since I was a kid. Hang it up. What? It's the grabber was behind him, wearing oh. the devil mask. Finn hangs up the phone. I know you're scared. You want to go home, and I'll take you home soon. It's just that, well, oh, everything's fucked up. Anyway, I gotta go upstairs for a while. Something's come up. What's come up? Never mind what. Did someone say something? Are the police coming? If you let me go before they get here, I promise I won't tell. The grabber starts laughing. It's not the police. So it's someone else. Someone's coming. I'll scream. They'll hear me. No, he won't. Not with the door shut. He? With the door shut, no one can hear anything down here. I soundproofed it myself. So go ahead, scream all you want. Nobody's gonna hear you. You're the one that killed the others. Bruce, Vance, Robin? That wasn't me. That was someone else. I would never make you do anything you wouldn't like. If you try to touch me, I'll scratch your face and whoever's coming will see it. And then they'll ask you why. The grabber looks so amused. He's having a blast. And he comes closer to Finn. And he taps his thick devil horned mask. This face? You know, I was down here once it, when it rang. Oh, it was the creepiest damn thing. I think it's static electricity that does it. it. It goes off and I picked it up without thinking to see if anyone was there. Was there someone there? No. And with that, he slams the door shut and you can hear it lock. Finn tries to scream for help, but the grabber was right. Nobody can hear him, not a single soul. So he reaches for the window. There's this window at the top of the bunker, and it's like double his height. It's literally right under the ceiling, so at the very top of the room, and there's metal bars. It looks like some sort of triple panel glass or something because nobody can hear him scream through it. It's just very sturdy. Listen, I love movies because I'm always so intrigued on how someone escapes. It's like the locked box mystery, but I really hope, I really hope that they don't convince a kidnapper 
offer to let their guard down to escape. So I'm hoping something smart comes out of this and you'll see what happens. It's actually really pretty smart. So let's get back into Finn. He's staring at the window and then he starts trying to brainstorm. He's talking to himself. He's pacing the room. He's like, no, no, no. I can't waste all my energy jumping. If anyone, has, if anyone could have broken the window, they would have tried it already. Robin would have done it. You're not getting out of here. I'm not getting out of here. And he's about to give up again and the phone rings. It echoes in the concrete room and Finn looks terrified, but he slowly walks up to it and picks it up and he looks hesitant. Hello? There's a clicking on the other side of the line. Nothing. He hangs up. He goes to lay in bed looking defeated once more and he falls asleep, but something wakes him up or rather someone wakes him up standing over the bed. But the vision is blurry, so we can't see what or who is standing over him, but we know it's not the grabber because Finn says, stop it. And the grabber is sitting on the ground on the other side of the room and he says, stop what? What? So it almost seems like the whole, um, you know how the mom was seeing things and hearing things and then the daughter is having dreams? So maybe he sees things. Mm. It's kind of the implication I got. Yeah. So he's like, stop what? Finn looks shocked that he's in the room and he wakes up. I, I need food. I'm hungry. How are your eyes? They hurt. Because remember, he was sprayed. Oh. Well, I can't bring you anything to eat. You'll have to wait. Is there someone upstairs that will see you bring me food? Don't you worry about that. If you weren't going to feed me, why did you even come down here? To look at you. I just wanted to look at you. And with that, he creepily walks out and locks the door again. And Finn goes back to laying in the cold, hard bed. He's scared. When yet again, the phone rings and it wakes him up once again. And he can't help it. He needs to pick it up. Hello? Is someone there? I need help. And then... There's static, loud static noise, and a creepy voice just says, Finny. He freaks out, drops the phone back, steps back, and uh, is this the grabber playing a sick joke? Who knows? But the phone rings again, and he hesitantly picks it up, and he hangs it back up, because he doesn't want whatever this is. He doesn't want the grabber to play jokes on him. It's so creepy, but it keeps ringing more and more and more, so he picks it up, and this time, there is someone on the other end. Don't hang up. I won't. Who is this? I, I don't remember my name. Why not? Because it's the first thing you lose. First thing you lose? When? You know? You know when. How do you know my name? We met once. Your arm is mint. You almost had me. Do you remember your arm is mint? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my god, Bruce, you're Bruce. Bruce? Bruce Yamada? Yeah, that sounds... F I'm Bruce. I'm Bruce. Your arm is mint. You almost had me. D did the phone ring for you? It rang, but none of us heard it but you. The grabber hears the phone too, but he doesn't want to believe it. Why are you calling me, Bruce? Your arm is mint. You almost had me. I'm glad it's you. Finny? There's a dirt section of the floor in the hallway where the tile is loose. Okay. Dig down underneath the foundation. I tried, but there wasn't enough time for me to dig up and out the other side. Will I have enough time for that? And the phone clicks off. Hello? Bruce? I'm gonna cut into these. Oh, uh, oh they're already hard. I think it's gonna be ooey gooey Whoa. and delicious. Okay, honey, you wanna try a bite? Hold sure, on, let me sure. try a bite with my little fork. Is it good? Is it weird? Oh, it's good. Mm. Wow. Mm. Wow. So candy works on mm -hmm. top of cookies. Okay. One bite mm. of the Kit Kat. Oh, good idea. Wow. Mm. Mm. Fantastic. Mm. Then we get a flashback into Bruce's life as a kid. How his parents taught him baseball from a young age. How he loves sports. How he was kidnapped. It, I mean, it's always the same manner as Finn with the black balloons escaping from the van. And then Finn is slamming up against a screen door and it looks like somebody's front door. You know how some doors have like the main door that you lock and then a screen door that you can keep yeah. open, right, to let fresh air in. And he's screaming, slamming up against it, trying to get somebody's attention. But it's not just a random montage. It's Gwen's dream. She wakes up in a sweat in the dark and she sneaks out, gets on her bike and starts riding around looking for that screen door that she saw in her dream. Because maybe that means that's the house that Finn is being held captive in. 
She's still running around all along. Yeah, because I guess the grabber really only grabs boys. Meanwhile, Finn finds the loose tiles that Bruce told him about in the hallway leading up to the bathroom and sure enough, there is a hole that he dug underneath a loose tile. So Finn starts digging more and more and dropping the loose dirt into the toilet to flush it and he keeps doing this all night long and when he thinks he did it long enough, it might be time for the grabber to come back. So he covers it and then he covers it back up with the rug and he goes back to sleep. Or at least he tries to. Meanwhile at school, another announcement is made. The grabber has another victim. And everyone in the school stares at Gwen to see her reaction. Because it's her brother. Meanwhile, it's finally breakfast time for Finn. The grabber comes in with a tall glass of soda and a plate of food. And he says, breakfast time. What did you put in it? Salt and pepper? Finn looks terrified. The grabber sets it down on the floor. Eat it, don't eat it. But what would I need to drug you for? You're already down here. And he closed the door. But this time, we don't hear that strong click of the lock. So Finn starts walking towards the door, about to open it when the phone rings. Don't go upstairs. It's a trap. What? Are you Bruce? Who's Bruce? I, I was just talking to Bruce. I don't know any Bruce. He's the baseball player. Well, I don't play baseball. Who are you? I don't remember. Well, did you play soccer, football? I deliver newspapers. Billy. And then our first jump scare. Billy the ghost is right behind Finn, standing there with blood dripping down his head. He's been murdered. So are these ghosts just all looking after him? You are Billy. So I think, you know what Bruce said of, you know, the phone rang, but uh -huh. nobody else could hear it. Yeah. So it took Finn to hear the other boys. None of the other boys could hear the other boys or see the other ghosts. Uh, but Finn, you know, his mom could see things and hear okay. things and the, the family has a whole history, right? Oh, uh, I see, I see, I see. And you're Billy. Maybe, but do not go upstairs. Why? What is he doing? He's waiting on the other side with that f***ing belt. He didn't say you could leave, so if you try, he's gonna punish you. He will beat you with that belt until you pass out and it hurts. It hurts real bad. You're gonna cry, you'll beg him to stop, we all did, but he just keeps beating you. And then the boy hangs up. Finn goes back to the door though, because let's be real, you can't give up the chance like this. A chance that you might be able to escape. So he starts sneaking up the stairs and he doesn't quite see, well I don't know if he quite see, but we can see that the grabber is waiting in the kitchen, literally in the middle of the kitchen, so that his, his chair is facing the basement door. He's sitting on a chair, shirtless, with the devil horn mask covering his face, holding a belt on his lap, waiting. Now, either Finn saw this or he knew he shouldn't, so he went back downstairs to eat his breakfast instead. So he avoided a beating and instead he fell asleep before the phone rang. Listen, Finn is busy just answering phones. It's like he works for a customer service center, you know what I mean? He picks up and it's Billy. You said my name was Billy? Yeah, Billy Showalter. Don't call me that ever again. And with his anger, you see the soda bottle that was with his breakfast shake on the ground. So there's like an energy in this room. Oh, so the ghost has energies. Yeah, and they're trapped in this room, I think, you know? Okay. And when the ghost is mad, you know, things shake in the room and uh, Finn looks scared and terrified. Don't call me that. I don't remember that life anymore. What, what do you want me to call you? What do you remember? I told you, I was a paper boy. Okay, fine, paper boy. See the wall in front of you? The wall is separated from the floor. There's a small gap. Yeah, I see it. I tore a long cable loose from down there and I kept it hidden. What am I supposed to do with that? And with that question, the soda bottle drops flat to the ground and starts getting back up and spinning aggressively and it spins, spins, spins until it's literally on one edge, which is physically impossible and is pointing towards the window. So Finn takes his advice and uses the wire to loop around the metal grate and he manages to pull himself almost all the way up, but the metal grate along with the cord falls to the ground, leaving him with no way to climb back up, no way to get back up to the window, but also with a huge problem. He's gotta hide this metal grate and hope that the grabber does not realize that the metal freaking grate is missing from the window. In school, Gwen has another dream that leaves her waking up screaming. She's taking a nap in class, okay? And it's a dream of Billy the paper boy, folding up newspapers and wrapping a rubber band around them. He has a golden retriever that's dutifully waiting behind him while he's, you know, doing his paper runs. Even while he's biking, the golden retriever is running behind him. It's so cute. But then the next part, 
of the dream skips to Billy being driven away in a black van with black balloons being loose and the dog is barking next to his bike, which was left behind. But the most crucial scene, she is given a glimpse of the grabber's face. He's in his devil horn mask, but he's standing in front of his ha house, laughing. And his house looks like all the other houses because they live in the middle of suburbia. But there's this creepy tree in front. It's like a leafless tree with the thin branches cut off, so it's almost like a dismembered tree. And boom, she wakes up. She rushes home that night, and she approaches her dad, who's drunk in the living room. Dad, can I ask you something? Sure, honey, come sit. But you promise you won't get mad, Dad? I promise. It's about my dreams. And her dad flinches, which causes her to recoil in fear, but he puts down his vodka and, with a not-so-loving voice anymore, says, What about your dreams? Well, what if they... You know, what if they're... Gwen, I'm gonna stop you right there. Your mother, she was special. She was a special soul. And she was smart, just like you. But sweetheart, she was also... She was touched. She heard things and she just became so convinced that her dreams meant something. And eventually, they told her to do things, terrible things. And so she took her own life. But they weren't real, sweetheart. They just weren't real. Well, I loved mom. And I loved her too, sweetie. No, I mean, I loved her the way that she was. I know, sweetheart. I just don't want that future for you. Do you understand? But what if I could help find Finny? And for the first time, her dad looks depressed and defeated. And he hangs his head. And the next scene cuts to them in his truck. And he's driving her around so she can look at the houses one by one. So the dad actually want to protect her. Yeah. And all of them. Yeah, but he is an alcoholic who, it seems like he doesn't just beat them for no reason. Yeah. It seems like he, well, okay, it is for no reason because there's no excuse to beat your children the way that he does, but it's also based in the 70s where discipline was more normal to be done in a physical manner in the American home. <laughs> okay, just putting that out there. <laughs> there was no such thing as gentle parenting. There was only a gentle spanking and a whipping. The police are also canvassing the neighborhood, knocking on every door looking for the missing children. When they knock on a weird dude's door, okay, this man, his name is Max, and he's got this big old dog that just keeps barking, and he's like, Samson, stop barking! <sighs> Sorry, how can I help you? I'm Detective Wright, this is Detective Lift. Um, we are canvassing the area looking for a missing child. Have you seen this boy? Oh, sorry, um, please come in, hold on. Samson, shush! And with that, the detectives are ushered in and Max starts getting straight to business. He closes the door and he seems a little bit, listen, I don't know if he's a true crime listener, but he's giving um, too much of a true crime listener, like to the point where we're like, ooh, this is not really, we don't identify with these people. Like, you know how there's a true crime listener who loves true crime and is into it because you want to learn about the psychology and you want to know these victim stories and also maybe from a paranoid aspect, but then you have the ones that are like really obsessed to the point where they're like foaming at the mouth of like trying to get involved and trying to point fingers at their neighbors for being a kidnapper for no reason and you're like i was just taking out the trash i don't know why the police just swatted me i have nobody in my house that's the vibe that this guy is giving me and he gets straight to business so all the kids walked to school right and they were all grabbed to and from school except for robin ariano he was grabbed on the way home to the he was grabbed on the way to the store on saturday afternoon to get some pop and a candy bar the detectives glance at each other and at the board that Max has now led them to, which is this giant map with a bunch of pins of where everybody disappeared and all of that shit. And it's like stereotypical red strings connected to the dots, you know what I mean? Pictures of the missing boys. So he has to be able to get the kids and get them back to his place very quickly, which means he's got a house with a garage. He can't risk taking them out, you know, it's gotta be a garage. And he can't risk them getting away or waking up on the way home. Which means the grabber has to live somewhere in this area right here. Right there. Mr. Um, Max. Okay. Mr. Max. No, no, no. It's just Max. Since we're all working on the case together now, you can just call me Max. <laughs> Sir, how long have you lived in the area? Oh, no, 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 I live out of town. I'm just crashing here. This is my brother's place. I've been reading a lot about this case a lot, and I'm in between jobs right now, so you guys could really use my help. Here's our business card. Keep working on it, and if you see any of the boys, give us a call. Or if I have any new leads or ideas, right? If you see the boys, give us a call. Okay. All right. <laughs> and as he's letting them out, they glance around at the mess, 
and they see a line of cocaine on the coffee table. Ah, uh, and you should probably clean up before your brother gets home. They're not going to crack him down because they got a bunch of missing boys, okay? Mm. And uh, <laughs> Max closes the door, and this guy is a weird one. He's, like, talking to himself. Oh, you stupid, stupid moron. God damn it, Max. You ruined it for us. And then he goes to the coffee table and snorts another line of cocaine. Meanwhile, another plate of food is brought down for Finn, and Finn pretends to be asleep. I know you're not sleeping. I'm starving. Tell me your name. What do you care? I usually don't. I find out in the paper. They usually print a nice big photo of all the details I could ever want about all the, boy, about all the things that you boys lied about. What's different this time? It's complicated. Too complicated. Everything's different. Nothing's going right. You could let me go. I'm thinking about it. I promise I won't tell anyone. You can blindfold me. Drop me off in the street. I will walk home. Well, tell me your name. Taylor. Taylor Mullen. The grabber throws all the food on the ground and throws the paper at him. There, on the front page, is his face with his name. I was really starting to like you, Finny. I almost let you go. And he runs out and locks the door. Which Why did he want to lie? Probably so that he can't find him again. Wow. You know, wouldn't you be scared if a kidnapper knows your name and you know nothing about him? Which, side note, how did he not notice the problem with the window? But once he's gone, the phone rings. Bruce? Hello? Billy, I mean, Paperboy? No response, and Finney hangs up. Meanwhile, upstairs the grabber is sitting on the same chair in the kitchen with his mask on, shirtless, and he's dozing off. The guy is sleeping in the kitchen on the chair. It's strange. Anyway, Finney starts collecting all the food off his plate and throws it back on, and he tries to sleep for the night, but he hears a trickling of liquid leaking from somewhere, and he has his favorite rocket pen in his pocket. So he uses a flashlight on one end and he starts scanning the room, looking for an exit and another jump scare. We see a boy suspended in the air, looking like he's being hung from his belt or something, so he's like flopping, and there's blood trickling onto the floor. We see the boy is bleeding and the boy pin points to the phone. And Finn walks over and picks it up. Hello? And he turns around and the bleeding boy is gone and his voice is on the phone. You don't have much time. The grabber hasn't been sleeping. He thinks this might be it, that he's going to figure it out. Who's going to figure it out? His brother upstairs. Are you Griffin? Probably. It's all a little hazy, but I imagine you know all our names. Every kid does. I didn't know you if you are Griffin. Nobody did. I spent so many years being invisible, and now every kid in the state knows my name. You don't have much time. Why hasn't he killed me yet? Because you won't play the game. You have to play the game. If you don't play, he won't win. What game? Naughty boy. If you don't play naughty boy, he can't beat you, and then he can't move on to the next part. And the next part is his favorite. What's the next part? The boy starts laughing. You don't have much time. You said that. He's not been sleeping. You said that too. Yeah, well, he is now in his chair, passed out, waiting for you to play. So what good does that do me? The door is still unlocked and he's asleep. There's a lock up on the other side of the door, to the front. The screen is locked. It's my bike lock. He took it from me. What's the combination? I don't remember. I remember I wrote it down somewhere. I, I, I was scared I would forget it. Where did you write it down? I carved it with a bottle cap to the wall. Which wall? The one on the right, about shoulder height when you're sitting down? Finn starts getting agitated, impatient. He runs over to the wall, shining his flashlight, looking for it. 23317. 23317. He grabs the phone again. It, but is it 23317? Or 23317? Or 23317? I can't remember. You have to try them all. And you have to be very quiet about it. Okay, thanks. And Finn hangs up, whispering the letters to himself, getting the courage to go upstairs. And he starts walking up the steps. The steps creak with every step that he takes. And he gets to the door. And at the top, he has to walk past the grabber to get to the other side, to get to the door. And we see that this is Max's house because we see the board with all the dots. His brother is the grabber. He gets up and he tries the lock. And it's so suspenseful, I'm not going to lie. And he gets to open it in what feels like an hour of quietly trying to get through. He opens the door, runs to the front, and right when he steps out of the house, 
we see the grabber behind him. So he sprints out and he starts running out through the neighborhoods trying to get away from the freaking grabber. Now this is the horror movie part that I don't understand. Why didn't this kid run through the residential backyards? Because grabber gets into his van and starts driving and he's still running on the mother sidewalk. Why are you running on the mother sidewalk? Why are you not running through people's backyards where people can't be driving and just snatching you in the van because did you not learn for the first time you got snatched on the sidewalk? Why are you not banging on the neighbor's house doors? Like, I don't understand, okay? So he's just running in silence on the sidewalk like he's doing a nighttime jog, <sighs> prepping for some sort of marathon and uh, the van catches up, parks, the grabber jumps out, tackles him to the ground, grabs a knife out of his pocket and puts it to his face. You say one f***ing word and I'll gut you like a pig right here, right here on the street, and I'll strangle you with your own intestines. So what choice does Finn have? And the grabber waits for a second before he says, Nighty night, little boy, and decks him in the face. Meanwhile, Gwen wakes up furious. She opens up her dollhouse and gets on her knees. Jesus, what the f***, Jesus? I mean, literally, what the f***? I ask you for help and you, you give me these clues that don't even mean anything and now I wake up this morning without any dream at all? Seriously? What the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> First of all, you let the grabber take Finny, right? And don't tell me you don't get involved because you've been giving me these dreams. And Gwen looks defeated. Unless you're not even real. Now back at the house, finally Finn wakes up and he's beat up everywhere and the phone rings and he's upset he's conflicted on whether he should even pick up because he keeps getting in trouble by these phone calls by doing what they're telling him to do hello am i gonna say anything do you even know who you are what kind of shit question is that do you know who you are i'm i'm Flin i'm finney blake well nice to fucking meet you finney blake right here this is it the horrifying nightmare end to your pathetic little life Holy shit. You're Vance. Vance Hopper. I remember you. I used to be scared of you. Trust me, Finny Blake. If you knew what you had coming, you'd be fucking terrified. Today's the day, motherfucker. And he hangs up. So we get a flashback, and it's also in the form of Gwen's dream. Vance Hopper, I mean, he mainly hung out at gas stations to play pinball. He's this really tough guy beating the shit out of all the other kids. Even when other kids would flash a knife, he would beat the out of them. He would take on two to three guys at a time and he would beat a kid for no reason. One time, he was so violent, he even tattooed something onto a kid's arm with their knife. But I don't think it was this, but in Gwen's dream, it's 7741. What does that even mean? But he had gotten arrested and before the police car drives off, Gwen walks up, looks around, and everyone's like, oh my god, Vance is getting arrested. Nobody can see her because it's her dream. And she gets into the car and she's sitting in the back next to Vance. And uh, nobody acknowledges her presence. Vance doesn't see her. The police don't see her. And the police car radio turns on and we hear Finney's voice. Do you even know who you are? And Vance in the back goes, what the fuck kind of question is that? Do you even know who the fuck you are? I'm Finney Blake. And Gwen starts screaming in the back, but we can't hear her. Nobody can hear her. Mm. This is a dream. And remember the part where he says, right here, this is the horrifying nightmare end to your pathetic fucking life? The police car had stopped in front of a house and he was pointing at the house, right here. So Gwen gets out. She gets closer to the house and studies the creepy tree in the front. Remember the creepy tree next to the guy? Yeah. And she sees the house number, 7741. Ah. Uh. And with that, she wakes up and she's terrified. And we get back to Finney, finishing his conversation with Vance, who's pissed, angry, full of rage. The whole room is shaking every time he gets mad. Have you tried stacking the carpets to reach the window? Yes, I've tried everything, Vance. No, not everything. When the grabber saw what I'd done, he was pissed. He took his time with me, too. He had to spend a fortune to fix the damages. What did you do? I'm getting to that, you wad. Or do you have some other important shit you gotta do? No, 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 I, I'm listening. There's an outlet in the across from the toilet. On the other side of that room is a storage room, but you can't get in there because there's a big ass freezer in the way. Go about two feet above the outlet, you'll, uh, through the wall, you'll see a panel with screws on it. Get the panel off and you'll get into the freezer. And through the freezer, you're in the storage room. Okay, thank you. For what? For helping me, I guess. And he screams over the phone, this isn't about you. And he screams so loud that the room shakes and the soda bottles shake and crash into the walls. Finn has to hover and cover his ears. 
But when that's over, he goes through the hallway to the toilet. And when he goes to the hallway, he has to jump over the little hole that he made under the rug. Mm. <laughs> so he doesn't trip. And he gets to work. He grabs the toilet lid and starts just breaking into the wall till he finds the panel with the screws. He even drinks the water from the toilet reservoir, like not the actual bowl, but the top part, because there's no water. He's not getting any food. And he ends up getting the panel open, and immediately he's in the freezer. He's getting rid of all the meat in there so he can crawl in, but the freezer is well locked on the outside. He's using all his strength to try and burst through it, but it's completely useless. It will not budge. So he crawls back out and is feeling defeated. He's crying on the bathroom floor. Listen, I'm so surprised that the grabber hasn't come in in any of these moments yeah. to see him trying to escape or like has seen any of the damage. I don't understand, but forget that plot hole. So the phone rings. Hello? Hey, Finny, what's happening? Robin? Hey, buddy, don't cry. I'm not. Yes, you are. I can see you. You can? I've been with you this whole time. I can see you. You've been with me? A man never really leaves his friend behind. My dad said that. He didn't leave his buddies when he went to Vietnam. That's why he never came home. And that's why I'm not coming home either. And I'm not gonna leave you behind. Well, we'll be together soon again, Robin. Fuck that. You ain't gonna go like I did. I've tried everything. Nothing's working. Yet. It hasn't worked yet. Do you remember what I told you? In the bathroom that day? That I need to watch Texas Chainsaw Massacre? No, before that, that someday I have to stand up for myself. Well, someday is today, Finn. Today is the day you stop taking shit from anybody. I'm not a fighter like you, Robin, and even you couldn't take him. You've always been a fighter, Finn. That's what we had in common. That's why we were friends. You were always afraid to throw a punch, but you knew how to take one, and you always got back up. Every time. I'm not strong enough. You have to be. You have to get out of here, and if you can't do it for you, you have to do it for me. What does it even matter? Because I don't want to die for nothing. I would at least die for a friend. And because I couldn't kill that motherfucker, you have to do it for me. How? You're going to need a weapon. I don't have anything. The phone. Fill the phone, the receiver, with dirt. Pack it in tight. Give it some heft. And then what? Then you practice. You take the phone. Step back, step forward, step back, and swing. Try it. Right now? And you see Finn practicing over and over and over again. And Robin is in the back practicing with him. It's like a cute little ghost story, okay? And now, go fill the phone with dirt. Will I still be able to talk to you then? No. This was the last call, Finn. It's all, from, it's all you from now on. Wow. I miss you, Robin. Then get out of here. Use what we gave you. Bye, Finn. And they hang up and Finn starts packing the phone with dirt. But not only that, but he gets to work. He's hiding the cable. He's doing a lot of weird stuff. We don't really know what he's doing, but we'll soon find out. Meanwhile, Gwen is riding her bike in the rain looking for the house that she saw, and she gets thrown off her bike, and she's getting frustrated because she doesn't see this house. And she's riding, 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 and in front of her, she sees five boys lined up with blood dripping down their faces. She stops so fast, she breaks so fast, she falls off her bike, and when she gets back up, they're gone. Oh, the boys that were dead. But in front of her is the house. She rushes back home, calls the detective to tell him everything. Meanwhile, we see Max snorting some more cocaine and staring at his map of crimes. And he looks intrigued. Because all the points where the boys went missing were near his house. His brother's house. Do they live in the same house, right? So... He Remember? Can't. The brother is staying with him. He lives out of town, but he's staying with his brother. The grabber oh. told him that someone's coming, and Finn um, thought it was the police, but it was his brother coming to stay with him. Oh. And then remember the phone call, one of the boys said, he's the brother upstairs. He's scared the brother upstairs is going to find out. Mm. Okay, I see. You know? So it's he's scared because he's holding a boy captive in the basement, but his brother is staying over. So all the points where the boys went missing were near his house, his brother's house, that is. So he tries to go to the door that leads to the basement, but it looks like both the brothers had some trauma down there because he looks scared to go down. And remember the part the grabber is like, oh, the phone rang once when I was down here. Mm. Kind of implies that he was held captive. Maybe their father was abusive or something, yeah. right? Okay. So um, he tries his best. He starts creaking down the stairs, and Finn grabs the phone weapon. When the door opens, it's not the, gra it's not the grabber. It's his brother. And he just opens it a tiny creek, so we just see his face like this. Holy fucking shit. I knew he was hiding something down here, but holy Mary, mother of God, I didn't know it was this. Please help me, please. You gotta call my dad or my sister. 
listen, don't worry. He's not here. He had to go to work. I'm Max. Please stay calm. No wonder he was freaking out this morning. Oh my god. Stay calm, kid. No, oh my god. This is fucking insane. Which, side note, Max still hasn't come in the room. He's still talking. And it's the cocaine. It's the frantic voice. It sounds unhinged. It sounds really creepy. Do you want to know the story of how I found you? Man, it's crazy. And Finn starts shaking his head no. No, not because he doesn't want to know, but because the grabber is right behind him with an axe. And he bonks it straight onto Max's head. He walks straight into the basement bunker like a zombie before he drops dead. And the grabber now just has his horns in, so his mouth is showing. And he's ready to kill Finn. But in the same moment, Gwen and the police arrive at the house. Are you sure this is the right house, Gwen? Yes, I've never seen it before. I've only seen it in my dreams. Please hurry, this is the house. In the cellar, the grabber is pissed. His mask is splattered with blood from his brother. Look what you made me do. You made me kill my brother. No, it wasn't me. He was an idiot, but he was still my brother. I'm so sorry, Max. Now, I'm gonna have to put you with the others. Looks like you'll find those naughty boys after all. And the grabber walks over to somehow plunge the ax out of the brother's head, and Finn is still clutching the phone in his hand, and the police are slamming on the door, and the grabber is like, what's up with the phone? I told you it doesn't work. Now normally, I would use a knife. But you're special, Finny. I'm gonna take my time. I want this to really hurt. And he calls the dog, Samson, into the room. He's this big, vicious dog. And uh, he looks quite hungry. And he's tied up to the corner of the room. So he's not, he's like barking aggressively. But if you were to try to run out the door, he would grab you. The police burst through the front door, they kick it in, and look, the police are finally listening to someone. Anyway, that's crazy to me, okay? They search the entire house and they clear it. They say, it's empty, it's the wrong house. Which gets me thinking. Yeah, because fucking kidnappers hang their victims up like curtains in the bathroom, and they keep the live ones in a fish tank in the living room. Like, idiot, no, it's not empty, you gotta look harder. They're literally going from room to room being like, there's nobody here. Meanwhile, downstairs, a huge fight breaks out. The dog gets chained up to watch and keep them company. The grabber is going at Finn with the knife or the axe, and Finn knocks him out with the phone. Runs into the bathroom, but remember, he jumps over the hallway where the tile is loose. And mm -hmm. that string that he had used to get the metal bar out, yeah. he had tied it across the hallway near ankle level. Uh. So he pulls it tight, the grabber's running after him, trips over the strung up string, and lands inside the hole. <laughs> and he sprains his ankle. So he's about maybe waist deep in the hole. So it's uh -huh. not like the easiest thing to get out of. And his ankle is sprained. Uh -huh. And um, Finn, meanwhile, punches him in the face elbows him, kicks him non-stop till he knocks off his mask and something about the mask being off turns the grabber into a completely different person. He almost looks scared. He's almost like screaming that the mask is off. Uh -huh. So it's almost like this feeling of, okay, when the mask is on, he's the predator. But maybe when it's off, he goes back into like this victim state. That's uh -huh. how he compartmentalizes. Because a lot of the times killers and kidnappers are people that have been, you know, kicked down before in their life, right? And the phone starts ringing. So Finn grabs the cord that he just tripped over, wraps it around the grabber's neck and starts pulling it. So he's choking and mm -hmm. the phone rings. Finn grabs the phone, hands it, to the, like puts it near the grabber's ear and says, it's for you. And it's Vance who says, welcome to the horrifying nightmare end of your pathetic little life. And he starts laughing. Today is the day, motherfucker. And then Robin gets on the line and says, I can't kill you, motherfucker, so, Ken is, so Finn is going to do it for me. And then Bruce screams, yeah, Finn's arm is mint. And with that, Finn starts pulling tighter and tighter until he snaps the grabber's neck. <gasps> what? But the problem is, he can't go to the door because the dog is barking up a storm. So yeah. what does he do? Think so about you go it. through the fridge. It won't open. Uh, oh, he throws the body, dead body to the dog. No? It's his owner. He won't eat the dead body. The meat from the freezer! Exactly! He throws a juicy piece of meat from the freezer to the dog and the dog gets distracted. <laughs> this is escape room. <laughs> and he runs up the door and he calmly lets himself out. Now the police find the basement door and they open it. But they don't find Finn. Instead they find nothing. No Finn, nothing. It's more like a soil filled basement and the stench is incredible. Oh my god. It's the missing kids. I think this is where he buries them. But this is not where he kills them. He must kill them somewhere else. 
Meanwhile, Gwen is sitting outside the house near the fence looking defeated, hoping that they find Finn. And when she looks up, Finn is walking out the front door of the house opposite. Walks out the door and makes eye contact with Gwen and they run to each other to hug and chaos explodes. Police escort them to safety while other officers run into the house to check the basement, guns drawn, a whole crowd forms and the dad runs through the police to get to the kids and he hugs them and he's profusely apologizing. He literally gets on his knees and he won't stop apologizing to his kids. So I guess the feeling was he was trying to make sure the kids didn't end up like their mom, but they ended up saving each other. So he feels probably pretty Maybe he was in denial that these things weren't real. That night, there's a press conference where a chief officer gives a speech. Our community's nightmare has finally come to a bittersweet end tonight. With the rescue of the missing, with the missing Finney Blake child and the discovery of five of the other victims. Here are the facts of this case by what we know. And he introduces the detectives. The suspect that we know as the grabber had two homes across from each other. One home where he kept the victims and another home where he stored their dead bodies. And with that, Finn shows up at school the next day. And everyone is whispering around him. That's the guy who killed him. No way. I thought he'd be cuter. What? There's no way he killed the grabber. Let's be real. The grabber looked like seven feet tall. I would have stabbed him. Why did he strangle him? I don't know. It's crazy. I heard him. I heard that he beat him to death with a bone. Finn ignores them all before sitting down in science class with his crush. And she just smiles and says, hi, Finny. And he says, call me Finn. And that's the end. A lot of people said that the end phrase was symbolic because all the other boys that were killed, they were too broken to know their names. Mm -hmm. So him confidently saying, call me Finn was like this moment of he was not another victim because he escaped. Mm. I think it was like a well-written movie. I think all the failed tries, like the string, the metal bar. So the metal bar was at the end of the hole where he sprained his ankle. Ah, so he really set up a yeah, escape room. Yeah, exactly. So everything, the freezer, the, like everything was tied together. All the parts that he needed to kill the grabber were there. And his angry stare the whole movie, like I said, it didn't feel like just an empty, angry stare of a kid throwing a tantrum. Mm -hmm. It felt like a kid who had just been through some shit. Okay, so from what I've gathered, right? Mm -hmm. The killer was abused by the father. Yeah. Now he wants to punish a little kid. Like naughty boys. Naughty boy and yes. abuse them. And Finn is not doing anything no. to trigger him. So yeah. he just can't punish him. No. Uh. So he probably was punished by being thrown into the basement and then he would sneak up to get out mm -hmm. and his dad would find him and beat him. So now that. he wants to just repeat that. Yeah. And he uh. can't do it because I think it's a part of him that's like, Oh, I'm only doing this to teach them a lesson if they play the game. Mm. Otherwise, he's just like this nasty perpetrator in his head. Yeah. Whereas he really is just a nasty perpetrator. Yeah, maybe in his head he's not. It's only that yes. motion is giving him satisfaction. Exactly. But they need to do something wrong. Mm. And he called um he called Finney Johnny, Johnny when he first took him down. Is that his name? It we don't know. Ah. Mm, okay. So a lot of people want there to be a sequel or prequel about the grabber's life prior to it. Listen, I liked it. I liked it. Is it Halloweeny? It's Halloweeny. I liked how they had both heroes. So like it wasn't just Finny being a hero, but Gwen was equally a hero in all of this. But she didn't do anything. She brought the police to the wrong house. No, the house where they buried the bodies. Oh yeah, but I feel like they're gonna find it yeah. eventually. They're like, okay, this is the killer. He owns two houses. Yeah. Let's check out that house. Yeah, yeah, but at least she was somewhat of a hero and not just like a random sister who was crying in the background. I liked it, okay? I really did. Now here's the problem with it. People hyped me up for it too hard. <laughs> like way too hard. The reviews of this are insane. I haven't seen movies with this level of reviews. So I was expecting the most profound horror movie going into it. And I think it's because we just did the When the Crawdads Sing and or Where the Crawdads Sing. And I feel like that movie, even though it was nothing compared to the book, so I've heard, it still had a lot of different themes going on and they were intricately well woven. Whereas this was an elevated horror movie. It's a horror movie that was elevated. Would I say it was the most mind blowing shit ever? Maybe not. I don't even know if I would demand a prequel on The Grabber's Life. But I don't know, what are your thoughts? And will you pick up if someone calls? What if dead people find your phone number? Would you pick it up?
much. Let me know in the comments and I hope you guys enjoyed. Make sure to check out established titles linked in the description and I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye.